Hi, uh, Mark Elliott back, and I'm here with uh, with you and nobody else today, for reasons I'll get to in a second, for office hours uh, 27. Uh, these are the last office hours for the Qing part uh, of uh, China X, part 6. And we invite you to join us in uh, early September when we begin part 7. Uh, and that will feature Professor Bill Kirby. Uh, you, you won't want to miss what he has to say. He'll be picking up uh, with the story pretty much from where we left off in early 19th century China. As I say, I'm, I'm here alone today. Uh, no Professor Bowl, uh, no Grace Jackson, no Tiffany Wong. Uh, I'm in London uh, and uh, nobody wanted to come with me. So uh, here I am. I have found what I hope will be a quiet place and I will uh, uh, do my best here, uh, flying solo, uh, to provide some feedback uh, uh, on the material uh, that we've covered uh, this week. Uh, you've been, as uh, before, uh, extremely generous in your comments, very thoughtful. Uh, so um, we'll, uh, uh, we'll get to those in just a minute. First, I want to uh, note that uh, the, uh, uh, you've been given an extra week for this module in order to get through uh, all the material. And you'll get an email later this week from staff uh, about final assessments and deadlines. Uh, there'll be a survey for the end of part six, uh, and uh, you'll get the conclusion, uh, the concluding video for part six, and uh, the auto-enrollment in process for part seven will be explained. You had a, a number of uh, questions this week. Uh, again, uh, far too many for me to try to answer all of them. Uh, a couple of simple questions, uh, for example, one person asked, uh, did the system of the banners continue in the late Qing? And the answer to that question is, is yes, it did. In fact, the eight banners system continued to operate in Beijing, even beyond the fall of the dynasty. We have some documents, uh, evidence to show that uh, the banner system continued in, in some form to operate up until 1924. So this system uh, did, in fact, uh, continue beyond, uh, beyond the Qianlong reign. Uh, one of you asked, uh, how much of a Chinese presence was there in England at this time? Uh, and as I say, I'm in London, and of course there's a very big Chinese presence in London today, and there has been for a long time. But at the time of uh, the McCartney mission, there was zero Chinese presence in, uh, in, in London or in anywhere in England. There were no Chinese uh, certainly living here. Uh, the uh, only presence, and it was substantial, was an indirect one, and that was uh, through the uh, enormous amounts of tea that were being imported, all from China. England had not yet begun to grow tea uh, in, the, uh, in the 18th century, it had not yet begun to grow tea in India. So all the tea that was consumed in England was brought from China, uh, and most of the porcelain that it was uh, drunk from, if people were wealthy enough to afford fine uh, tea services, uh, that, uh, that China, that what we call China, that porcelain, was also uh, brought from China. So in that way, people were very much aware of China. There was a lot of, there were books about China that were quite popular. Uh, gardens were being designed with uh, what people imagined to be uh, Chinese motifs and, and, and that kind of thing. There was a, a, a period of, uh, in fashion, and design we sometimes call chinoiserie, uh, in which uh, designs from China were, were uh, uh, adapted uh, to Western tastes, and, and they were seen a lot in, in uh, designs for, uh, for instance, uh, plates, wallpaper, uh, gardens, as I already said, that kind of thing. So in that regard, China's present, otherwise uh, not really. Uh, other questions had to do with uh, the reaction of McCartney and his entourage to the Great Wall and the Forbidden City, uh, as the uh, uh, questioner asks or, or, or notes. Uh, obviously, these are huge in comparison to European palaces or defensive structures. And of course, that's true. Uh, McCartney uh, does make a, a reference. He describes the Great Wall in some detail. They passed through uh, the uh, through the wall on the way to the. Uh, summer palace, uh, the hunting grounds in, in Chengde. Uh, these were no longer dis defensive structures at the time. They were in uh, partly in ruins. Uh, and the British spent a fair amount of time actually uh, making drawings there and describing them, taking measurements. Uh, they were allowed to uh, uh, investigate really as much as they wanted. And they found them very impressive, as, uh, as you would expect, uh, if, a bit, if a bit forlorn.
In regards to McCartney, you also asked about further readings. And McCartney's diary, his journal, was uh, edited and published a number of years ago, about 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, and uh, this is a book that you can find uh, probably in your local library. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's available online or not. Uh, and uh, there are other uh, journals by people who traveled with uh, with McCartney that were also uh, very popular by people like uh, William Stanton. Uh, William Alexander published his drawings about McCartney's, uh, about the McCartney mission. He was the official artist of the mission. Uh, so there's a fair amount of, uh, of material uh, surrounding that mission and there's a lot of scholarly literature about the famous uh, encounter between McCartney and Chenlong, whether McCartney kowtowed or not. Um, one book uh, that uh, you, you might want to look at is a book called Cherishing Men from Afar. Cherishing Men from Afar by uh, James Hevia, who's a professor at the University of Chicago and has uh, looked into this in, in some detail. So that's one possibility for further reading on the subject. Another question was, how come there was so much corruption and was it avoidable uh, and how could you avoid it? And this gets to one of the questions that you were asked uh, to think about also, which was, uh, what was more serious? Uh, what was the more serious problem in the, uh, at the end of the Chenlong reign? Was it corruption or was it rebellion? And the answer uh, seems pretty unequivocally to have been that the more serious problem was corruption. So Olga Godlevska wrote, for instance, Corruption, which was first creeping, unrecognized, and even tolerated, and later became obvious, parenthesis, Heshan case, was the reason for the state's decay, namely for in the inefficient tax system, discriminating examinations, understaffed administrations, widespread poverty, and growing popular discontent. All of these faults of the state apparatus were disastrous for governing such an immense territory. People stopped waiting for help from the government and started to look for alternative forms of managing their daily, uh, their daily life. Self-governance in distant provinces, numerous religious sects, as well as rebellions are all manifestations of this striving of local communities for self-organization and thus improving their lives. So I think that this is, uh, this seems to have been pretty much the, uh, the consensus. Uh, and as far as the question of like, how do you prevent corruption, well, this is something that, of course, governments struggle with uh, all the time, uh, including up to today. Uh, the Qing had uh, no magic bullet, that uh, silver bullet that uh, was able to, to stop this. There was a note, noted decline in corruption in the, uh, under the reign of, of the Yongzheng Emperor, Qianlong's father, whom you, you may remember, I, I said, was fairly, uh, uh, was very rigorous, uh, 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 administrator uh, in the lecture on the Three Kings. And Yong Zheng realized that uh, the, uh, the system made it impossible for, for magistrates and other officials to not skim something off uh, all the money that they were collecting for the state because in fact most officials were paid very very little and they were not even provided money to hire people to help them run their offices. So the, uh, one of the solutions for, that Yong Zheng put in place was to uh, allow that a certain percentage could be taken and that percentage varied upon the part of the country that you were in. And if you stayed within that level of uh, uh, skimming, we can call it that, uh, then you were rewarded with what was called a nourishing honesty allowance. So by keeping your, uh, uh, the, the amount you, you took off the top to a modest level, uh, you received a bonus. And that seems to actually have kept uh, what we would call corruption, and there are all kinds of definitions of corruption out there. That seems to have kept corruption down for a bit. Uh, but as is, seems to be inevitable with uh, any kind of uh, uh, governing bureaucracy anywhere in the world, uh, eventually uh, people find out what they can get away with. The temptations to line one's pockets uh, becomes uh, too great. Uh, and corruption gradually uh, sneaks back in. I don't think there's any permanent solution to this problem. It calls for constant vigilance uh, because people are clever and they always uh, will find a way to game the system if they possibly can. Uh, so this was uh, one thing that uh, administrations in the 18th and 19th centuries in China uh, struggled with. Uh, it's something that the Chinese government uh, right today is struggling with uh, in a very... Uh, um, 
in a very much publicized fashion, which uh, many of you probably are, are following uh, in, uh, in the newspapers. Let's move on to the uh, discussion forum question. The discussion forum question asked, does Chen Long's letter seem ridiculous to you? Why or why not? And the letter that we're referring to, of course, is the uh, one of two letters that Chen Long wrote uh, in response to the uh, petition from the British brought by Lord McCartney. Uh, the letter was addressed to King George III, uh, explaining why uh, the Qing court was not going to agree to any of the requests that the British had made. Now, nearly all the responses to this question uh, were to the effect that uh, the letter uh, does not seem ridiculous or absurd. Absurd was actually the word uh, that uh, Russell uh, used, and we were not trying to, uh, some of you asked, is there, are you trying to ask a, or, or to imply that there's a difference between being absurd and ridiculous? Uh, and we were not, uh, we were just paraphrasing, really. Uh, the idea being that, uh, uh, did the letters make sense to you? Could you figure out the, the, the logic behind the letter, or, or did it just seem so wholly strange and incomprehensible that there's no way you could understand why anybody would write such a thing? And uh, with uh, very, very few exceptions, I have to say, um, everybody felt that uh, the, uh, the letter made perfect sense and that it was, in fact, quite a, uh, quite a polite response uh, to, uh, to Chen Long. There were different takes on that. Um, so let's go through some of these. Uh, again, there was uh, quite a volume of them. Uh, I've just picked out some that, uh, that struck me uh, as uh, um, particularly uh, uh, pithy. So uh, A. Baldock uh, wrote, uh, I do not think this letter sounds ridiculous. Uh, China encompassed around a quarter of the world's population at the time, whereas Britain ruled comparatively fewer people and less land had less wealth. Uh, the idea that this letter is ridiculous, in my opinion, stems from a Western bias and self-centered nature uh, and inability to appreciate the power of another uh, somewhat mysterious culture. Uh, du Bois Halb, uh, whom we've quoted before, um, re remarked that it doesn't sound like the emperor was someone you could call ignorant. Maybe he's not hip to the world trade scene. I like that, uh, <laughs> that idea. Uh, but there's too much evidence, even in our brief overview, of a considerate, able, well-educated, and well-informed mind at work here. And I'm inclined to, the view, uh, inclined to view this letter as both highly formal, which I think is quite true. We need to remember that this was a diplomatic document. It was deliberately written in very grand, uh, grandiloquent, uh, not to say grandiose uh, language, meant to impress. Um, uh, so I'm inclined to view uh, uh, this letter as both highly formal, diplomatic, and full of admonitions and references to evidence of generous gifts and economic arrangements to avoid its being interpreted as harsh or condescending. So uh, here's a remark uh, that the emperor is actually going out of his way to cushion uh, his, uh, his refusal by uh, noting all the other uh, good things, uh, the other compromises and uh, um, uh, allowances that the Qing, uh, the Qing has made. Uh, now, Du Bois' help goes on to say, of course, knowing what we know now, uh, coupled with the fact that hindsight is twenty twenty, makes us all look foolish at times, and shifting political agendas can cause our perspective on a statement uh, to move from the sublime to the, and then dot, 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 uh, obviously uh, the ridiculous uh, uh, here. Uh, so you know, we can understand why people 110 years ago might have thought that this uh, seemed absurd, uh, but uh, with a little bit more distance on how we ourselves view things, uh, maybe, uh, maybe this isn't so absurd uh, after all. Uh, there's also a reference here to uh, the uh, Chenlong Emperor. Said, I guess the Chenlong Emperor didn't read his Virgil, or maybe he did and learned the same lesson about uh, those bearing g gifts from other sources. Uh, the idea, uh, beware of Greeks bearing gifts from afar, um, beware of strangers bearing gifts. Uh, the, uh, the Emperor being prudent, saying, no thanks, uh, we'll pass this time. Uh, there's a very thoughtful response from Ted Kurtz, uh, quoting here, I think the context here matters. From the point of view of the Chinese emperor, the British visit was not an invited one. They just showed up. And there had been no previous communication, as far as I know. He, meaning Chen Long, rightly saw that the British had an agenda. It was the British who were arrogant, not the Chinese. 
He says, I think that the emperor was perceptive here and he read the British intentions correctly. Things change later, but in the context of the visit and in its time, this letter is not ridiculous. It was a firm pushback to the British, couched very mannerly, but a firm pushback nonetheless. He saw the British as untrust untrustworthy users who acted as though they knew what was best for China. Now, in response to, uh, uh, to Ted Kurtz, uh, there is a comment by Rito Wynn. I do agree that the context matters, Ted Kurtz. I would agree that from an internal point of view, it was the most natural thing in the world for the Chinese emperor to reject the British overture. And the fact that it was done in this grandiose yet thoughtful manner shows that the Chinese emperor was on top of things as far as China was concerned. But, and here we get a little bit of a, a different nuance, it is also true that the Sinocentric worldview itself, which shines through every single line of this letter, the in inability to see foreigners as anything else than inferior, anything else than an audience to witness and admire the great spectacle of perfection that is the Chinese empire, is an expression of sublime institutionalized arrogance. So here the arrogance is on the other foot uh, from the point of view of uh, Rito Wynn. Continuing more or less in this same vein, there was a, a comment by Sylvia 26 MC. She writes, given the Russell quote, this seems like a very leading question whose answer ought to be no, not ridiculous. So I guess we didn't fool anybody on that. I suppose it would be normal for the Chinese to refuse to trade with the British, mostly because they didn't have anything particularly interesting to trade, that is the British. They had recently lost the American War of Independence, so perhaps the Chinese thought the British were a waning empire. Also, opening to England might mean having to necessarily open to the rest of Europe, which the Chinese were not prepared to do. The Qing were concentrating on their borders as well as on putting down their internal rebellions. In other words, they already had plenty on their, on their plate. Somebody else made a comment to that effect. Uh, they didn't need this extra, uh, extra d uh, distraction. But she goes on to say, however, given all this, even if it wasn't ridiculous, it wasn't particularly far-sighted either. And this uh, uh, was also the conclusion of Albert Esses, who, uh, in a very short uh, comment, uh, wrote, Ridiculous? No. A mistake not to engage more in relations with England? Maybe yes. That was pretty much the, uh, the view of things, that the letter was, was not... Uh, not at all uh, absurd or ridiculous. It made perfect sense in, in its time. It's a diplomatic document, after all. It was the first visit by the British uh, asking these kinds of things of the, uh, of the Qing court. Uh, so uh, it would be uh, unreasonable, actually, to have expected things to just have gone swimmingly uh, with, the, uh, the, with the Qianlong Emperor saying, sure, uh, let's do this, let's work out a deal. This was so alien, the idea of uh, setting up permanent embassies and, and so on. So alien to Chinese ways of thinking about economy, about state organization, that it would have been pretty surprising, in fact, uh, if, uh, uh, the, uh, if the Qing had, had decided to uh, go along with, uh, with these requests. But there was by no means a, a complete agreement on this point, and there was a very lively debate that emerged uh, between uh, dogma uh, and uh, P.C. Zhang at one point. Doug Ma says, uh, I'm surprised by how many China Xers think both that Qianlong's response was, quote, perfectly reasonable in rejecting European suggestions of official contact and or that a Manchu emperor was necessarily expressing China's national interest. We aren't or perhaps shouldn't be discussing the European actions, but it isn't hindsight to suggest that Qianlong was mistaken. And then there's a parenthetical comment here. Ridiculous and arrogant as descriptions are a bit irrelevant. One can see that in the context of the time, the response was explicable, so Dogma allows that. But for a country that had much experience of contact with other countries, including, for example, the Dutch colonization of Taiwan during the Ming, it was a fateful mistake and not at all reasoned. In another post, Dogma wrote, I think ridiculous is too pejorative. The letter is strangely pompous in tone, but diplomatic niceties have evolved. George III's letter was from, quote, His Most Sacred Majesty, by the grace of God, King of Great Britain, France and Ireland, Sovereign of the Seas, Defender of the Faith, and so forth, uh, which makes a good fist of rivaling Qianlong's claims for pomposity. Nevertheless, the letter deserves its status as a pivotal point in China's relations with the world, 
Uh, and uh, he writes, uh, Qianlong's letter, however, reeks of a complacent arrogance, and he is patently irritated by the upstart British. One senses an old man's conservatism, and it is unfortunate that his advisors could not see beyond the protocol. Later on, uh, Dugma makes the point, what the British were asking was in fact strongly in China's interest. Though the huge advances of the Industrial Revolution were still in the future, European science was already making rapid progress. In rebuffing the British request for improving trade and cultural ties, Qianlong was displaying an arrogance that was to cost China dearly. He demonstrates a contemptuous lack of interest in his visitors, but the visitors had much curiosity about China. And McCartney's astute evaluation was to play some part in promoting the reciprocal hostility of the British and their idea that China could only be roused from its despotic torpor by violence. So not ridiculous, but willfully blind. So in many of his comments, and I, I cite Dugma because uh, he was thorough in rebutting a lot of claims on, on the site, and this was, uh, he was the only one uh, who uh, was uh, so uh, uh, determined to, to argue, uh, argue this line, which is a very, I mean, it's a very fair argument uh, uh, to make, uh, that he was, that Chenlong was conservative, uh, many comparisons with Peter the Great. Peter the Great saw that it was important for Russia to uh, catch up with the West. Uh, why couldn't Chenlong? And here I would simply say that, I mean, Peter the Great was dealing with uh, a, a civilization, a culture that was uh, by no means anywhere nearly as, uh, as sophisticated as that of, of China. Uh, so uh, I think that the comparison, I mean, it's an interesting comparison to make, but I don't think we should expect that uh, uh, the the contrast uh, between what he was here, what Chenlong could have known about Europe and China was nearly so great as that which uh, obtained between uh, most places in Russia uh, when uh, Peter took over uh, and, uh, and Western Europe. Um, uh, in response to other people saying, uh, if China was, as you suggest, more powerful than Britain, then how come the Qing forces were soundly beaten by a tiny British force, uh, by tiny British force a few decades later? Uh, and this is referring, of course, to the Opium War. Actually, the British barely beat the, the Chinese in the Opium War. They were not so, mili the military superiority of the British was by no means so clear-cut. Uh, in the war between 1839 and 1842. The British were, for the first time, deploying armored steamships in battle. This was an experiment for them. Uh, and when you read the British accounts of the fighting, uh, they met a pretty stiff resistance. Uh, so uh, I don't think it's quite fair to say that the, the edge that the British had at this point, uh, or any other Western power, was so remarkable. Uh, nor would their encounter with the Dutch on, on Taiwan have been much use because when the Dutch colonized Taiwan, Taiwan was not part of the Chinese Empire. It didn't become part of the Chinese Empire until the 1680s uh, under, uh, under the Kangxi Emperor. So uh, that would not have registered as any kind of a, of a lesson for, uh, for the Qing. So as I say, we have... Uh, uh, many uh, many comments here, and then a debate that emerged between Dugma and P. C. Zhang. Uh, very uh, a very interesting debate. One of the most interesting I've I've seen uh, in the, in the course really. Uh, and I can't read the whole thing. Uh, if you're interested in it, uh, I urge you to to take a look yourself. Uh, briefly, uh, P. C. Zhang agrees that uh, we can understand the context of this letter, but it still seems to reflect a kind of arrogance. But then. Uh, as far as the question about whether Qianlong should have seen what was coming uh, in terms of how we frame this uh, whole, the way we look at things, uh, P.C. Zhang has something interesting to say. As for the modern world and China's inability to adjust to it, which this letter is taken as an example of, then that is quite another story. The emergence of the, quote, modern world in its most popular sense has conspicuously coincided with the rise of the European and later North American colonial slash imperial powers. The quote modern world in which we live has been heavily influenced, if not defined by, the West. It is therefore no surprise that in this quote modern world, the only culture that seems quote modern is the Western culture, the culture that shaped and defined the modern world. And in that perspective, Chinese culture, along with many other cultures, Islamic, Indian, etc., seem unsuited for the modern world, again in quotation marks.
The mainstream historical narrative treats the rise of the West as a fundamental advancement of human civilization. To some extent, this is true. Uh, however, whether this development can truly define the West as more advanced, quote-unquote, to me is unclear. While conditions in Europe improved, it was enabled by enslaving people from other continents and, in extreme cases, annihilation of entire civilizations, referring to sub-Saharan Africa in the first case and the Americas in the second. Speaking from the present, I would argue that China has adjusted quite well to this modern world. Although China was forced to sign many unequal treaties with various colonial powers, it still re retained much of the territory of the Hai Qing. And, and uh, PC John goes on. So this points actually to one of the big questions, one of the big problems that will form the, the heart of uh, much of the narrative for uh, the remainder of, of the course, which is the story of how China comes to grips with the encounter with the West. Uh, previously, its, its major encounter with an other has always been or had always been with uh, the inner Asian other. Uh, the Manchus being only the most recent example of that. Uh, before them, of course, the Bongols, uh, the Jurchens, the Khitans, uh, the Toba in the Northern Way, the Xiongnu before that. Uh, so all of those uh, peoples uh, in various ways had presented different kinds of challenges to a Chinese civilization, to ideas of Chineseness, to territorial sovereignty, such as those ideas existed at the time. But the arrival of the West was a very different kind of challenge. It came from a different place. Uh, and it was of a different nature. Right? The Industrial Revolution represents a kind of qualitative change in the direction and shape that history takes uh, that uh, was really unprecedented, uh, I think, from before. Well, I don't even know when, but uh, certainly for most of recorded history. So uh, the, uh, uh, the challenges here were significant. We can disagree about whether Qianlong, uh, Qianlong's response made sense or not, whether it was the right response or not. Uh, but uh, probably, uh, I think Dogma is right. Whether it's absurd or not, or maybe Lord Russell's question wasn't the right question, uh, but uh, it still stands as an, uh, a pivotal point in our understanding of uh, relations between China and the West. Again, a story, as I say, uh, that will dominate a lot of uh, the rest of, of the course. It's been a pleasure. Uh, I'll see you again in the conclusion to uh, uh, part six. Uh, but signing off for now from London, thanks very much, and thanks for watching. Bye.